Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Centre for International Governance Innovation, or CG as, we, CG as we say. My name is Fred Kuntz, and I'm the uh, Vice President of Public Affairs here at CG. Uh, thank you to our off-site audience joining us from around the world through our live webcast. And following this evening's address, we welcome questions from both audiences here at the CG Auditorium or through the live chat function on your screen. Please remember to state your name when you ask a question and keep your comments brief. I'd also like to thank and to congratulate our public sponsor, Wordsworth Books. Uh, Wordsworth Books has been a faithful event sponsor of CG Select Series since, uh, well, many years ago. And tonight we want to congratulate the owners, David Worsley and Mandy Browse, on the bookstore's 30th anniversary. <laughs> Change transition brings about sometimes a new sense of normal whether discussing the transition from one life stage to another or the introduction of a new political leader, every transition we experience in life challenges us to adjust to a new kind of normal. Since the financial crisis of 2008, the international economy has been in a state of transition. The change has brought about a new normal, a new old normal. Uh, tonight, the president of the Peterson Institute of International Economics, Adam Posen, will discuss the characteristics of this old and new normal. Uh, we'll have Domenico Lombardi, who is CG's Director of the Global Economy Program, uh, more properly introduce Adam in just a second. Domenico joined CG in uh, 2013, last year. In addition to giving direction and leadership to CG's Global Economy Program, Domenico is also serving as the Chair of the Oxford Institute for Economic Policy and sits on the advisory boards of the Bretton Woods Committee, the G20 and G8 Research Groups, and the Istituto Affari Internationale in, in Rome. Please join me now in welcoming Domenico Lombardi. Good evening. Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce a colleague, uh, a friend, um, someone uh, you know we have been working with uh, pretty closely over the latest year, Adam Posen. Adam. Uh, is an advisor to the uh, Congressional, to the U.S. Congressional Budget Office. He was an advisor to the Koizumi government in Japan, uh, was an advisor to the U.K. Cabinet Office at the time then Prime Minister Gordon Brown was organizing the G20 summit in April 2009. And most recently, he served at the Bank of England as a member of the Monetary Policy Committee the monetary policy decision-making body. But most importantly, Adam is uh, the president of the uh, Peterson Institute for International Economics, uh, one of the leading uh, uh, think tanks in the world, and really a think tank uh, with which we are very uh, delighted uh, to be uh, partnering. So, uh, Adam, uh, without further ado, uh, I will leave you the floor. Uh, Tonight's lecture is going to be about the old normal for the world economy. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Domenico. Thank you, Fred. Thank you all for coming out. Um, as is often the case when I'm speaking, I have to ask myself what sorts of people take themselves on a weeknight to go hear a lecture about macroeconomics by a foreigner. Um, you people, uh, and I'm glad you're here. Uh, joking aside, uh, as Domenico mentioned, uh, the Global Economy Program at CG and the Peterson Institute have been working together more closely over the last year since Domenico smartly joined CG, and there are a number of our events on our website and CG's website you can look up, and I hope this is just the latest, the latest in our ongoing train. Uh, so what do I mean by the old normal? Why should you care? Uh, what am I talking about? There is a deep human need for normality. Uh, and normality actually in a very statistical sense, that things return back to an old average. Uh, our brains don't function very well when there's constant change. Moreover, in economics, it turns out that much of the statistical relationships on which people build forecasts, build analyses of the world, 
they also rely on what's referred to as mean reversion, which is the idea that over time, things eventually get back to where they were. Most of all, and I know CG is an interdisciplinary place, and this is an interdisciplinary crowd, there is the notion of history repeating itself, that there are very few new things in the world. So that's a bunch of platitudes. What I would like to do is tell you with extreme certainty which parts of the old normal are coming back and which by implication are not. And then you can go forth with this greater understanding of the world and make money betting against hedge funds, lobby your governments, demand action from your local officials, or write the bestseller I never got around to writing. <laughs> the world that we were in over the last five years was arguably less unusual than people make it out to be. What we had was a financial crisis, let's call it the North Atlantic financial crisis, even though uh, Canada got away with it. Uh, both your southern neighbor and your friends across the Atlantic did not. Um, it actually looked a lot like other financial crises. And it had many of the same roots, lackadaisical bank supervision and regulation, uh, political concentration of power, uh, shifting sentiment, animal spirits, as Keynes would put it. But it did take place on a scale that was unseen before, or at least unseen in decades. And so there's been a tendency of people to say, well, we're in uncharted territory. But what I think has happened is there's been, again, a natural human tendency to overemphasize the importance of the last few years' experience compared to the long past. And the degree to which things are different now, I think, has been vastly exaggerated. And I think the most important way to think about this is from a perspective that I hope a CG audience would appreciate, which is thinking about the role of the large powers, the, the US and China and others, in the international system. That in some sense, the economics is being driven by not just politics, but by global politics and institutions. That this is the underlying background against which all our economic possibilities take place. Now, I don't want to be overly deterministic, but we are living in a world where fundamentally two things have happened. The first is the relative size and power of the US and the world economy has shrunk. Note, I said relative. This is not to say the US is in some form of absolute decline. We can discuss that if you're interested. This is not to say that the US is voluntarily taking itself out of the power business. One could make the case they are, but again, that's not the point. The point is there was this artificial world, arguably from the end of the Cold War through the mid-2000s, a roughly 15-year period, when the US was extremely dominant in political, military, and economic affairs. And this was an unsustainable position. Various mistakes made by US officials, various strategies pursued by others around the world may have accelerated this, may have determined the path. But the idea that the US would remain such a large share of world GDP, such a large share of world finance, such a large share of world intellectual content, such a large share of world decision making was simply unsustainable. The second large institutional or geopolitical force I would note is that we're living in a world where technolo technological acceleration seems to be waning. Now, many of you have probably, being well-read and well-versed, have heard versions of this before. Recently, Lawrence Summers has relabeled this secular stagnation. 
Uh, the distinguished economist at Northwestern, Robert Gordon, has done a bunch of work on this. Uh, Peter Thiel, who's a famous technology investor, has spoken about the slowdown of technology. But again, the, the basic idea is periods where technological innovation is moving very, very fast at the frontier and the most advanced economies are actually relatively rare. There was the steam train, there was air conditioning, there was with a multi-decade lag until we had the software and the size to utilize it, the transistor. And that's really about it in terms of economically transformative technologies. And so if you take these two characterizations of the world, which are open to argument, but I think a large majority of people would agree with, uh, at least in part, that the U.S. in relative terms has to shrink, and that we are probably in a period where technology will not be advancing at the frontier as fast as it did in the 1990s. Then a whole host of things come to the fore. And this is what I refer to as the old normal. This is a world in which, for one thing, the provision of public goods, global public goods, is likely to be more uncertain and less universal than it once was. What do I mean by global public goods? I mean such things as protecting the Straits of Malacca from pirates. I mean such things as provision of GPS to people who are not allies of the US. I mean such things as we're sadly seeing now uh, vaccinations against polio. Um, these kinds of things that was cheap and in the seeming self-interest of the US, not necessarily directly to provide, but to encourage, or to at least, as someone was pointing out in a discussion earlier today, to punish those who didn't comply, that world is receding. I'm choosing the word receding consciously. It's not shattered, it's not disappeared, but it's receding. These are gonna be spottier. And that means a world that's a little bumpier. A second piece that just comes out of these first two assumptions about US relative decline and technological slowdown is that you're going to see reduced enforcement of intellectual property rights around the world. Now this is not, I, in balance I think this is probably a negative, but there are people who will make serious arguments, and I know there are people in this town, this, this hotbed of technological innovation, who can make serious arguments about why excessive protection of intellectual property rights is a problem. You've got the, the so-called patent trolls who are out there who buy up concepts and make it very difficult for others to innovate. You also have the issue across the world that in India or Brazil doesn't get the kind of access to medicines that they might if there was less property, intellectual property right protection for the big pharmaceutical companies. This is actually, in economic terms, a very classic trade-off that there's some, the more you protect property rights, intellectual property rights, the more the people who can innovate have an incentive to innovate, but also the less that those technologies diffuse around the world. And there's some optimal point between these. Of course, in real life, we never get to the optimal point. But what I'm trying to say is that we've been in a period where intellectual property right protection was pursued very vigorously by a very dominant US partly in the interests of its own corporations, but nonetheless with some benefits. And we're moving to a period where that's going to be less the case. And that tends to reinforce the technological slowdown. A third point about the old normal is that in such a world where intellectual property rights are more porous, it's easier to copy, it's easier to steal, but also where the rate of technological advancement from the richest, most advanced countries slows down, is a world where catch-up is faster. In other words, 
there is something in economics called conditional convergence, which is the idea that if you're a country that has its basic act together, has property rights, not just intellectual property rights, but rule of law, property rights, some price stability, some peace and quiet, um, conditional on having that basic set of attributes, you will converge on the frontier. And the further away you are from the frontier, all else equal, the faster you'll catch up. This is the sort of think in your heads intuitively, this is the low-hanging fruit idea. This is, you know, Haiti, if they, God would let them ever get their act together, you know, it ha gets to start privatizing a few things, rationalizing a market, adopting some basic sanitation and, and infrastructure rules, etc. And that very quickly adds to growth. And then when you stop being Haiti and you start being China, it's a little harder to catch up because you're a little further along. And when you stop being China and you start being South Korea, you're very close to the frontier and so you probably don't grow as fast. Anyway, if you take my first two assumptions as writ, as of course you should, Good, the audience understood that was a joke, that's good. Um, it, it is a, a pretty straightforward thing to demonstrate, both theoretically and empirically, that that means the bottom countries are catching up faster with the top countries. On the one hand, it's easier for them to steal and adopt technology. On the other hand, the top countries are not extending their lead as much. Okay, so we've got a world that's bumpier. Got a world of technological slowdown. Got a world of spottier intellectual property rights. Got a world of faster convergence from the poorer countries to the rich. All of which feeds back into this situation where the relative decline of the US or the other hegemons is accelerated. And where the ability of the US and the other countries at the technological frontier, which obviously Waterloo, if not Canada, is, um, to leap ahead is diminished. What's another implication about this kind of world? Another implication about this kind of world is it is a world where the business cycle is more bumpy. And one of the odd things about the last 15 years was what was called the great moderation. Uh, it was at least called that amongst mainstream economists. And what the great moderation what was strange was we ended up having very low inflation and relatively stable growth rates, particularly in the US, but also in Western Europe, in Canada, in Japan, and various other places. And it has become increasingly clear that this was as much luck as anything else. Uh, again, in the discussion, I can go into the reasons why. But there were people who thought it was the result of marvelous policy discoveries that we were just doing things much better in the 90s and the 2000s than we ever did before. And there was a little of that. And there were people who thought there had been a fundamental structural change in the economy, so the economy was more stable. And that clearly is not true, as 2008 to 2010 demonstrates. Fundamentally, it was luck. But so what that means is we're moving to a world where it's bump, going back to where I started, it's bumpier than what we've recently gotten used to, and it's also bumpier in real terms. Because in a world where there's more large economies, and there's more convergence, and there's less public goods, there's less smoothing of the cycle. When the US was dominant, if the US, and I meant dominant in just sort of the, 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 the sense of the immensity of it, not a, not a aggressive posture, although at times, of course, there was. But when the U.S. was the totally dominant economy, stabilizing the U.S. economy had enormous stabilizing effects on the rest of the world. And very small acts by U.S. policymakers to the benefit of other economies could make a very big difference. We're still in a world, and we're throughout the crisis where the US stabilizing its own economy, I would argue, and most people would argue, was to the benefit of the whole world. But it's just less effective than it used to be. If you're Brazil now, to take an example, your relative size in the world economy has gone up significantly. You're much less dependent on trade with the US, on financing with the US than you used to be. 
And the old saying about you catch the flu every time the US catches a cold is less relevant for you than it used to be. But that also means that if the US has a bit more of a boom or the US extends more credit, it doesn't necessarily help you as much as it used to. So we're moving into a bumpier road. And these bumps, my next point, I think I'm on point six. Um, these bumps are going to take more and more the form of what economists call real shocks, not nominal shocks. In other words, they're going to be about growth rates, about the relative growth rates of different sectors, about swings in aggregate demand, about employment levels. They're not going to be swings in price levels. Now, that doesn't come directly out of my initial two assumptions of what came next, but it is closely related. In a world of low growth, low innovation, in a world where every economy is having more and more to self-insure against the vagaries of the world environment, which many countries are already doing, there's more and more an emphasis on building up savings. Building up precautionary savings at the household level, on governments building up stockpiles of, of reserves of hard currencies with which to deal with problems, on markets betting or on or sanctioning, though depending how stable they look at the fiscal outlook of economies. And in a world in which households and governments are saving more and more, they don't have exactly the same effects. There is a paradox there of composition, but anyway, for this purpose. You have a situation where the households are more and more anti-inflation because when you have savings, you don't like inflation. And the governments are more and more anti-inflation because the relative benefits of them being austere, consolidating fiscal policy versus spending the goodies have changed in the political calculus and the economic calculus. And so we're moving to a world of higher savings, smaller government deficits, despite what you've heard, more stabilizing price stable focused monetary policies, self-insuring currencies. There's a little bit of an offset. Some of these self-insuring currencies tend to weaken against the dollar and that imports some inflation. So I mean, it's not a uniform picture. But in the broad, it's a world where inflation is going to be quite low. Seventh point, I think. If you take what I've accumulated here, it starts to help explain a phenomenon we're seeing right now that's both very troubling and somewhat puzzling. It's more troubling than it is puzzling. And that's that throughout the US, Canada, Europe, Japan, essentially the Western rich world, Corporations are sitting on huge amounts of cash on their balance sheets and not investing. Now, the idea that you're a manager, you've seen a crisis, you've seen interruptions in your flow of credit, therefore you want to keep more cash on hand, that's pretty straightforward, makes sense. But the extent to which these companies are building up cash war chests and the willfulness with which they're refusing to spend this money to invest, even though we live in an environment now of very low interest rates, even though they've foregone investment a couple of years because of the financial crisis and there's stuff to catch up on. This to me makes more sense from the old normal worldview I'm giving you. Returns on technology are low. World is more uncertain. In that kind of world, the incentive to invest is diminished on the part of corporations. Now, of course, you could say, well, this doesn't really matter because if the markets were functioning correctly, ha. If the markets were functioning correctly, shareholders would force these corporations to disgorge their cash in the form of dividends or share buybacks or something. And that, I'm not going to try to tell you I have a, a grand unified theory of the world. I haven't yet figured out how to explain why that doesn't happen in terms of my theory. 
There are plenty of good reasons why you know why that doesn't happen. When I say good reasons, I mean persuasive reasons. I don't mean nice reasons. In particular, there's the fact that even such legendary institutional investors as Ontario Teachers Pension Fund, which everybody professes to wish to follow, do not do a good job of forcing these companies to disgorge their cash. But I digress. In terms of my list of holy writ, the fact that corporations are going to be doing low investment for the foreseeable future is another piece of it. So this all sounds pretty depressing, I guess. And what I really like to tell you is it should only be mildly depressing. And it should only be mildly depressing for a few reasons. First, there is something to be said in world terms and human terms for the poor people of the world catching up with the rich very quickly. I don't mean necessarily at the expense of the rich. I, I, I actually don't mind that the US on average is richer than some other countries. But I do feel strongly that it's a good thing that uh, approximately 1.3 billion people have come out of abject poverty, you know, dollar, two dollar a day poverty over the last 20 years. And in the circumstances I'm talking about, this situation is likely to be maintained or accelerated. A second piece, going to some of the things that your colleagues here at CG work on, is from a governance perspective, it really is not necessarily an evil thing that the US does not have a completely dominant voice in various affairs. All else equal, I probably would prefer the US point of view in a lot of areas to that of the other countries likely to step in. I'm afraid in my scenario I do not expect the glory days of Premier Trudeau running the world to come back anytime soon. Um, I guess you didn't like that joke. Um, <laughs> but from a social justice global governance point of view, if we are going to move towards more multilateral regimes and we are going to have more legitimacy in the world, it's okay for the US not to be the dominant player. The third way in which I would suggest that this is only mildly depressing is that, going back to where I started with sort of the high concept work, this is the normal. This is the sustainable state of the world. Now, I, I'm not Thomas Hobbes. I'm not going to tell you the state of nature is leaves man solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Maybe short, but you know. It's actually the life of man is not solitary, poor, nasty, British, and short, but I digress again. Um, but there is something to be said for a world that is not based on bubbles, on fantasy, on unrealistic expectations, on temporary excesses of power, and a world that will be knowable in contours for a sustained period. And that's what I think we're going to end up with. Now, I've gone 25 minutes. I'm supposed to go roughly 30. Let me take five minutes to link it to two other issues. First, as I'm sure everybody in this room is aware, there's been a little kerfuffle over inequality recently. And there's now a new famous book on inequality that has caught the moment. Um, without going into that particular book, it is this point of view that I'm telling you goes back to a very fundamental way you have to decide how you view the inequality issue. Do you view inequality as a within country problem, a between country problem, or a between people problem? If it's between people, human beings on this earth. We are now in a more equal period than we've ever been, except for, say, the depth of the Middle Ages, and living standards are a little higher now. My colleague, Surjit Bala, a distinguished Indian economist, made this point in a book for us I know, about 10 years ago called Imagine There's No Country. And if you think about 
how many people in India, especially in China, but also in Eastern Europe and parts of Latin America who are now effectively in the world's lower middle class, that is a convergence we have never seen before in the world. Now, does that get linked to the within country inequality in say the US or Canada? Debatably. I honestly don't think so. I think the people who do think so make a very common mistake, which is they, they, they think of trade as one part of the world taking jobs from another, whereas trade should be thought of as technology. So again, I'm sure every lecturer who comes here makes some comment about the magic transformation of Waterloo and the magic transformation of the beautiful Seagram's, what was the Seagram's building, into the different kind of Seagram's building we now have. I mean, I can just say, my parents grew up in Toronto, and you know, I told my mother I was coming up here to give a talk, and she's like, oh God, Kitchener, Waterloo, that was the truck farms, that was where we used to get the food, the fresh vegetables. And it's true. Um, Trade is really the embodiment of technology. It's embodiment of technology change. And so if there's anything to be a little depressed about in my story, it's this somewhat self-reinforcing, somewhat exogenous fact that we're going to be in a period of slower technological progress. I said fact. It's, a, it's, a, it's an assumption. It may be wrong. I'd be very glad if it were. Finally, some of you may have walked in here and heard my mellifluous tones and said, I thought I was getting a talk on the global economy. So let me just say one or two brief words about the global outlook. Everything I've talked about here is about the long term, but it is the long term that's already started now. None of this means that you can't still do a lot of harm with bad policies. None of this means that differences in how well you respond to the business cycle, both as individuals and businesses and as governments or societies, matter. It does matter. And we can see this across Western and Southern Europe right now. It matters how you choose to deal with this world of constrained growth and low inflation and slower, faster catch up in some places, slower growth in others. And absence of a governing central body. And so in my view of the old normal, it actually should be somewhat reassuring to you for the next few years. Because what I'm telling you is the rules haven't fundamentally changed. A society like Canada or the U.S. or many of our neighbors and an increasing number of societies around the world that do have price stability, that do have property rights in the broad, that do have rule of law, that are, through God's grace and others, at peace, they will continue to grow. They will continue to utilize technology. They will continue to trade. This is not a world where globalization falls apart. This is not the drama of 1913. This is not a world where technology leaves us. This is not the drama of the end of the Roman Empire. This is the old normal. It's a little boring, but it's not a bad outcome, and we should get used to it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Adam. Uh, you really covered uh, a wide range of issues. Uh, what I would, I would like to do is really to push you a little bit further on uh, at least a couple of issues that uh, uh, we at CG are particularly interested in. So you said that uh, essentially whatever scenario we are going to consider, the US share of uh, uh, global GDP, you know, is going to shrink. So, uh, in other words, 
you know, we should uh, embrace the idea of um, an increasingly multipolar, multipolar world. Uh, if we look at the recent um, history of, uh, you know, the world economy and the global governance arrangements, what we have seen is that the current framework of uh, global governance arrangements, no matter, you know, how limited they are or well-functioning or malfunctioning they have been, they've been really set up under the driving force, under the impulse of the United States. And, uh, you know, the Bretton Woods Conference, whose 70th anniversary, uh, you know, is, is going to be in a, in a few weeks, really, from now, uh, wouldn't have happened had not been for, for the United States and other allied countries, uh, including Canada, of course. Now, uh, does that mean that um, uh, we, we can think of a multipolar world as still providing or maybe providing be a better global governance infrastructure? Or, uh, you know, a uh, multipolar world essentially is going to imply increased fragmentation. Uh, let me be a little bit more specific. So, again, what we have seen since the end of uh, the Second World War is that, you know, the U.S. provided the political impetus, for instance, for the establishment of the International Monetary Fund. Uh, right now, it's, you know, the U.S. is receding, is retreating from that. The U.S. Congress has failed to approve uh, IMF quota reform twice in a few weeks. And clearly, uh, you know, on the other hand, there are a number of emerging economies. They, may, they do want to strengthen, to set up, or even strengthen regional financial arrangements to safeguard their trade flows, the stability of their own economies. And what is not clear at this stage is whether this, uh, you know, regional uh, uh, financial architecture is going to evolve, for instance, in, in, in a way that is consistent with, um, you know, a, a global architecture uh, centered on the IMF. So in other words, I mean, I think we should not take for granted that a multipolar world uh, um, necessarily brings, uh, you know, a bet better gov global governance arrangements. Um, and, and therefore, you know, I would like to probe you a little bit on this issue, uh, whether um, essentially this uh, multipolar uh, type of economy is going to be more beneficial, not just in terms of growth, but also in terms of the global governance infrastructures that uh, we uh, certainly all hope for. Okay. Um, thank you, Domenico, for trying to take my broad sweep and make it more practical. Um, so let me say one thing in the general and then focus in on sort of the IMF issue that you and others here are working on. <coughs> Excuse me. In the general, I think it is fair to make an analogy from our normal lives that sometimes by creating more legitimacy and inclusion in a process, you make the process less functional. And I don't think it is in any way an oversimplification to state that that's where we're moving towards. Um, that we had a world as you state, when for the Bretton Woods institutions were set up 70 years ago, or even when the, um, the previous World Trade Round was settled, the Uruguay Round, that the U.S. with a few key partners and a little bit of arm twisting could make things happen. And increasingly over time, you had to make side payments like there was the trade-related intellectual properties deal with the, with the Indians, which the Indians think wasn't to their advantage, it may not have been. But you increasingly had to make some side payments, but basically the big boss could get things done. And we're moving to a world where we are going to see more legitimacy and therefore more seats at the table and more, and more of the people who are at the table will actually speak and vote and do ideas and there's going to be more debate and less is going to get done. And again, there are some things where I don't want to oversimplify, but I think in this case it's, it's genuinely true. The, the, the G20 
does not work as well as the G7, both because there's 20 people at the table or 20 interests at the table instead of seven, and because back in the day of the G7, the U.S. just sort of pushed things, um, and in the G20, they can't. Now, to some extent, one would hope, I almost might go so far as to say expect, that's probably a little strong, but one can reasonably hope that on the rare occasion the G20 does actually get something done with the additional legitimacy of having had more voices and more countries involved, it will have more staying power, it will be more popular, it will have more opportunity to grow and deepen than some things that were imposed by the US. Now, does that give you a general prediction on fragmentation or regionalization versus core international? institutions, and that's a very interesting research agenda that CG is tackling, I hope. Um, and I'm afraid the answer is it depends. It depends on the alignment of issues and views in a given area. So in world trade, we have the outcome that the WTO is basically seen as legitimate and is treated as legitimate in the very fundamental way that, again, with occasional exceptions, um, countries including the US and China will go to it and have their, their disputes adjudicated and have punishments meted out or whatever you want to call it, penalties, um, and abide by them. Not always, but largely. You know, that's pretty big. And that's juxtaposed with the fact that there is no hope of a multilateral trade deal at any time in the near future. So that's one example. In the area you mentioned, which is of course critically important, the IMF and regional financial arrangements and, and, and how that's gonna go. Um, you know, there, there, there is a legitimate question. I, th I think there is more impetus to regionalization there in the direction that you were mentioning. Uh, this has been kicking around for a good 15 years since the Asian financial crisis in the late 90s. I think um, there, given the way Europe has behaved in terms of regionalizing everything except the, the external costs of its crisis, um, you know, it's very hard now for the U.S. or for anybody to say, well, Asia or Latin America can't take its own regional resources. The interesting questions are, does this kind of fragmentation lead to a worse outcome in that instead of having a global regime, you have a spotty regime and certain countries or regions are left out of it or underfunded? Does this lead to a race to the bottom in the sense that IMF conditionality, which certainly improved from 1997 to 2007. Um, does that mean that they always go to their local buddy instead of the IMF and so conditionality isn't strong enough? There are a number of issues you can raise, but going back to a word that you used, that I used, that it's, this is a receding issue. I, I don't view it as a fundamental crack up. Uh. You also mentioned uh, the Eurozone, and uh, you mentioned this uh, current outlook for low inflation. At CG, we have done some research trying to gauge the impact of low inflation on the dead dynamics of uh, uh, the economies under stress in the Eurozone. And what we have seen is that, uh, essentially, given the scenario of low inflation, assuming for simplicity inflation at zero for the next uh, uh, five years, Essentially, uh, we're not going to see any improvement in the debt sustainability of the peripheral economies. Peripheral including uh, uh, Spain, but especially Italy, at 135% of debt to GDP ratio, uh, Greece, um, and so on. So, uh, and this is a more of a sort of a self-serving question. At CG, we work a lot on uh, debt, re debt restructuring mechanisms, how to improve the uh, international coordination on this, uh, uh, on this policy agenda. So, what do you think is going to be the end game for the Eurozone? Um, you know, we see very low inflation, uh, 
it's going to be even more difficult to stabilize that dynamics. It's, it's going to be even more difficult the intra-eurozone rebalancing. And, you know, growth seems to be picking up, but marginally. Um, so what is your scenario for, say, five years down the road for the Eurozone? Is it going to be a scenario of flat growth? Uh, you know, you were mentioning a broader scenario of slower growth in the world economy, and maybe the Eurozone can be growing even, mm -hmm. even slower than that. Well, I, th I think this is an example, Domenico, that, that illustrates what I was trying to say at the end, which is even if on average the rate of technological progress is slower and therefore on average the growth rate at the frontier is slower, the kinds of policies you run, the kinds of governance you run does make a material difference to people's lives. You know, this is a question of where you are versus that average. And I, I think you and I have both written on this, many colleagues here have written on this, I think the approach that the European Central Bank and the German government have taken in the Euro area is has imposed a lot of pain and a lot of wasted output and wasted person years of work for very little gain. And to the degree there was gain, it was about um, making sure that the bad loans that Northern European banks made to Southern European banks and Southern European projects when they went bad, all the burden was on the Southern Europeans and none of it was on the Northern European lenders. Um, so sort of picking up on where you, you began your question or your comment, you know, debt restructuring, the, the, the reason I was concerned about debt restructuring in Europe isn't so much about even debt dynamics or about governance, it's about the fact that recovery would have been faster and more widely shared if the lenders had been forced to take part of the losses. We had an analogous debate in the US where mortgage lenders made all these terrible loans to a vast variety of people in various regions around the US and there was supposed to one, there were, should have been efforts by the U.S. government to do what were called cram downs and write downs, basically telling the lenders, don't lock in the people to having to pay the full written value of the debt, take a loss on part of it, and that will enable them better to resell the house, get work, make it sustainable. And that's what I think was the lost opportunity in Europe, and that loss is, is going to dwarf almost anything else that happens going forward. But so when you talk about governance and, and debt, I mean, I think we need a world where restructuring of debt, whether it's in the domestic scene as in the US mortgage market or the international scene as in the cross-border lending within the Euro area, that restructuring has to be much easier and the bias of governments has to be to do, force some more losses on the lenders. And this is similar to what I said about intellectual property rights. There's a trade-off. At some point, if you force all the losses on the lenders, then people will borrow recklessly and no one will lend. But if you force all the losses on the borrowers, you end up with the kind of stagnation we've seen, and it's unfair. So anyway, just to get us back to, you said, where's the euro area going to be? Uh, I have a colleague, Bill Klein, uh, who you know, who did a book for us on European debt. From a, he has an interesting method of trying to assess its sustainability. And we'll be releasing it in the next month or so. And he actually comes down more positively, more optimistically than you at CG do. That even under relatively pessimistic scenarios about growth and inflation, um, with the exception of Greece, the debt levels in Southern Europe are sustainable. It's going to be interesting to compare notes when... In a few years down the yes. road, yes. But I mean, the bottom line is, um, you know, where, where are we going to be in this new normal? I do think because of these things that they have done, Europe will be continuing to grow more slowly. It will undergo what I call robust stagnation, as far as the eye can see. And then, you know, in your presentation, uh, what I noticed was, you know, your reference to the fact that we should be prepared for a more bumpy 
uh, world economy or more bump economic cycle. Uh, we should be uh, prepared to accept more volatility in the international economic cycle. And uh, you know, this brings my question on uh, uh, how you assess progress on international financial regulation. Clearly, you know, since the international financial crisis, there has been an effort in trying to um, you know, strengthen financial regulation, extending it to the non-banking sector, so-called shadow banking. And you know, one, one view is that by doing so, you tend to contain risk, you tend to reduce risk. The, the other competing view, however, is that that risk is still going to be in the global financial system, and uh, if uh, you know, you're you are trying to reduce the risk in the sh so-called shadow banking, that risk is going to migrate to some other entities. Yeah. So, in a way, uh, you know, what has been achieved so far um, by uh, you know, the international community under the lead of the Financial Stability Board, in a way, is not really optimal or desirable. And so, you know, I would be interested in uh, um, having your take on that. And, you know, relatedly, Again, another area where progress has been made under the lead of the Financial Stability Board has been on the GCF, so-called Global Systemically Important Financial Institution. Again, some see this attempt to uh, strengthen regulation on the GCF as a way to better manage systemic risk. Some others, however, see that as essentially a way of to of institutionalize the too big to fail. So in other words, these are institutions that are so important, so critically important, that you know, uh, there is nothing we can do about, and uh, we cannot uh, impose on them the market discipline that uh, uh, you know, we would otherwise impose. So you know, I would be interested in uh, uh, getting your take, especially because the financial sector can act as a, uh, you know, should act in theory as a sort of stabilizing device. So in a way, you know, um, on the one hand, it could reduce volatility, but on the other, it could also amplify, exacerbate that volatility. So I would be interested, you know, in uh, getting your take on both the progress that the international yeah. community has achieved on international financial regulation and how do you stand in terms of the specific initiatives. Well, again, let me... If, you, if you'll forgive me or you'll allow me, let me try and link it back to some of the themes we talked about and then get more specific. So when we sat down, you know, I was talking about the idea that G20 is more difficult than G7 and it's more legitimate if you, if you do it right, but you may not get a good outcome. You can have things that are run very top-down, command-oriented, and still get them wrong. Okay, so let's be very clear about that. That, that, that having the wrong analysis, the wrong ideology matters. And so Governor of the Bank of England, Mark Carney, former Governor of the Bank of Canada, is currently running the FSB, which is the Financial Stability Board, the G20 set up coalition of government negotiators and regulators to try to regulate the global financial system. And he and a few other people are running it as an extremely closed entity, uh, extremely top-down driven with an accelerated agenda. Uh, even some governments who are represented there don't feel they're being listened to. With the sincere belief on the part of Governor Carney and a few others that this is how you get things done and it's important we don't have regulatory uncertainty hanging over us for a long time and many of these other countries and other interest groups are just going to distract and let's get it right. Um, but the fact is they're getting it wrong, in my opinion. Um, and we discussed this some at our internal seminar this afternoon, so I'll recap some of what we said there and what I said there. Um, I think we're getting it wrong in some very fundamental ways. So we're getting it wrong in that we're still under-regulating the banking system and over-regulating or even appropriately regulating some of the non-bank parts of the financial system. Now, many people will argue in good faith a variant of what you put out. 
which is that if you regulate the banks too much, you're just going to force all the bad, risky behavior out into someplace else that's less regulated, into shadow banking, into whatever, and you'll be left with the same problem even worse. And this is a bad outcome. And what I would argue is that here's a place where I think things are not quite that simple. This sort of runs, and this is a common fallacy in policy making, uh, I'll call it the, test, the, the toothpaste tube model. You have your partially used tube of toothpaste, and there's a lump of paste here you want to get out. And if you squeeze it here, it pops up here, and if you squeeze it here, it pops up here, and you squeeze it, squeeze it at different places, the lump of toothpaste just moves up and down the tube. And so people say, see, you can't, you can't get rid of that risk. However, it matters whether the bulge comes out here in the middle of the tube or where it comes out the end and, and, and goes in a six-inch stream past your, uh, your toothbrush. Putting it differently, it's not, it's not the same risk with the same effects if it's done by banks and done by non-banks. There is, I believe, good reason to think that when banks take bad risks, it's more harmful because of too big to fail arguments, because of deposit insurance, because of the, the leveraged, inherently leveraged nature of their balance sheets, because of the inherently illiquid nature of their assets. And so even in the worst case scenario that we squeeze the toothpaste out of the tube, but the stuff gets spread out over here, it may not do that much harm over here in the insurance sector, in the hedge fund sector, in the commercial paper sector. It may not be great, but it actually is genuinely less harmful over there than over here. And so to me, I think they've got fundamentally the wrong approach. The other way in which I think the FSB and the current state of financial regulation is, is, is messing up is that you know, you raised earlier the issue of fragmentation, and financial fragmentation is a very serious issue. Um, fragmentation both in terms of the inability to move savings across asset classes and in terms of moving savings across countries, across borders. You know, there, 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 again, there is some happy medium between having capital move with breakneck speed everywhere at all times versus having each country dependent on what gets bottled up in their banking system at any given moment. And I think there are things that they could be more constructively doing under the heading of structural change, meaning deciding there are certain kinds of financing that are better than others, there are certain kinds of institutions that should exist, like for securitization of small business loans, that should be made to happen. And the FSB doesn't have that on its agenda at all. It's all about tweaking the incentives of existing players. And I view that as a mistake. Adam, uh, I have uh, one more question before we open up the debate. And we also have a number of online questions lining up. Uh, I'm familiar with uh, one of the various books you wrote. Uh, in 1999, uh, that's 15 years ago, you co-authored a book on monetary policy with a former Fed chairman, Ben Bernanke. Uh, I'm not going to summarize the book, but uh, I think, broadly speaking, uh, this was uh, an attempt uh, uh, to sort of depersonalize monetary policy. Mm -hmm. So first, um, I would like to uh, ask you, do you think that Chairman Bernanke was successful in his tenure at the Fed in depersonalizing monetary policy? And more broadly, I would like to ask you, if you were to rewrite the book now, 15 years past, following the great financial crisis, how would you rewrite the books? You know, yeah. how, in you know, what fundamental way yeah. you would essentially rewrite what you did 15 years ago? Well, you and CG will have a lot more fun when you invite Chairman Bernanke here and ask him about that. Um, and you also get a much more excited crowd. Um, no disrespect to you. I'm just saying you're, you're, you guys. You guys. You guys are the easy crowd. You're, you'll come to me. Um, on the point about depersonalization, I mean, I, I, Ben Bernanke and our two co-authors, Thomas Laubach, Rick Mishkin, and I had very explicit discussions about the fact when we were writing this that we felt 
there was too much power imbued in the individual of Alan Greenspan, and pre before that in the individual of Paul Volcker, and the, the Fed and other central banks really should be run by committees, and um, the committees should be powerful. And we were not alone in that. Pierre Seclos is in the audience, has done some work on this. Alan Blinder's done some work on this. There are a number of Charles Goodhart, there are a number of people who've worked on this. That was one piece of our proposal. And I give, among the many things I think this world has to be thankful for in, about Chairman Bernanke's um, conduct of himself and the Fed while he was there during the crisis, was that he very, very consciously, um, not that I was talking with him while it was happening, but I talked with him before it happened, he very consciously made it so that other members of the committee could speak out more, both internally and externally. He very consciously worked hard to keep the opinions of other committee members as part of his decision-making process and to have decisions that got more buy-in. Not unanimity, that's fine, more buy-in. And even though he made himself very available and personally accountable, he did not seek to confer on himself the kind of guru status that both Volcker and Greenspan may have had thrust upon them, but certainly enjoyed and exploited. Um, and for this, I find him, among other reasons, I find him a very admirable public servant. It takes a lot of, a lot of self, self control to do that. And I think, he, I think with the histories written, that will be a sub theme, but it's a valuable sub theme. In terms of our book and what I would have done differently, um, the book was actually a, a book called Inflation Targeting Lessons from the International Experience. And for those of you who followed what went on with the Bank of Canada, which was one of the cases we studied, you're familiar with this concept. When we were writing, the Bank of Canada, the Bank of England, the Reserve Bank of Australia were, and the Reserve Bank of New Zealand, of course, um, were this handful of countries who were pursuing what was then called inflation targeting. And we were advocating it both in general terms and specifically for the U.S., in part to depersonalize policy, uh, but in part to come up with a system that was a little more rules-based, a little more counterinflationary than the very discretionary system the Fed was running under, but not taking us back to the gold standard or something nutty. Um, what would I do differently? There's a lot of technical things I would have argued differently. But I guess I would have made, I'll just write off quickly, four things I think we got wrong that I would reconsider. First, that um, we, we wrote as though we thought inflation targets could be moved over time up and down relatively easily, and that was a mistake. It was, inflation targets turn out to be like exchange rate targets. Once they're set, people are scared to move them uh, because then it looks like you're sending a weird signal to the markets. And so the system was less flexible than, than it should have been. Second, um, in part over my objections, but I put my name on it so I can't complain, um, we, we, we stipulated to agreed with a, a lot of the received wisdom about um, macroeconomics that was dominant in the mid-90s, which included the assumption that the trade-off between output and inflation was, was, was very short-term and not very steep. Or, or close to vertical Phillips curve is the technical term. Um, that was wrong empirically at the time, but we, we, we chose not to fight that issue. Actually, I, I, I'm not sure anybody else would have chosen to fight that issue at, at the time. Um, but that was a mistake. And it led to the third thing which I would have changed, which was we, we put a huge emphasis on uh, what's called the anchoring of inflation expectations, the idea that the point of inflation targeting was it allowed you to keep forward-looking inflation expectations in markets and businesses and households from getting out of hand when you loosened policy. I think that core intuition is right, but I think we, we emphasize too much the, this forward-looking nature of inflation expectations rather than recognizing, as proved to be the case when I was at Bank of England, that the expectations are actually much more sticky and inertial than they should be. And then the final thing was we, by omission, by joined a large share of the profession in um, not having the central bank explicitly take financial stability into account when setting its targets and um, 
sorry, at one point that was closely related to that, I forget it, I apologize. But anyway, that, that we, we like, again, it doesn't absolve us because we were part of the profession, but we were with a lot of people and just making the mistake of having too narrow a conception of what the central bank should focus on. Very well. So uh, what I would suggest is that uh, we can uh, take now questions from the audience. There are at least two mics on each side of uh, the auditorium. Uh, if you do want to ask questions, please, please identify yourself. And um, we also have, uh, as I said, uh, a few online questions lined up. So who, who wants to break the ice? Well, why don't you start with the online, since I seem to have scared the poor people in the audience. <laughs> So, uh, Chris uh, from Waterloo is asking uh, whether you could elaborate more on uh, uh, what you said about uh, the role of technology in trade. Yeah. And, uh, you know, its implications for growth, for convergence, and so on. Okay. Um, so, the classical vision of trade is an economy has an endowment. And the endowment may be natural resources, it may be the skills of its people, it may be the amount of money it has, but it has some fixed stock of something. Um, and that is your comparative advantage, and you trade as a result of that. So Ricardo, who created the original theory of trade, talked about Portugal and Britain trading, and Britain had wool from its fabulous manufacturing, and Portugal had port and wine, and therefore, even if Britain could grow wine, or even if Portugal could grow, could manufacture wool, the, the British were enough better at wool and vice versa that that's where the trade comes from. And if you view the world that way, then the politics become very straightforward and challenging which is any time you sort of open your market, you, you get a kind of reversal of fortune. Um, this is known in economics as the Stolper-Samuelson theorem. So let's say you're Canada, and you were very well endowed with natural resources, and you were not very well endowed with high-tech scientists because in the past we didn't have this beautiful Waterloo. Um, and you join NAFTA. In this worldview, you end up having a very straightforward redistribution, which is U.S. is short of natural resources, so we bid up the value of your natural resources, which were relatively abundant in Canada and therefore cheap, and the U.S. dumps a bunch of scientists on your market, uh, and that bids down the value of your scarce scientists that you had here in Canada. Anyway, that's the static view of the world. And in that view of the world, trade is just a question of what you start with and who you're trading with. What has become increasingly clear in recent years of research, and I hope this is responsive to Chris, the online person, is that trade really isn't about those kinds of things, although in the extreme it can be. Trade is really about the progress of technology. So, why is it that there are no textile mills left in the U.S., basically? Is it that we had cheap labor in China? Well, no. It's that the technology of producing cloth became cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, and therefore was less able to fund first world jobs, and therefore was easier, here's the technology catch up, for the people in Nepal and Cambodia and other places that are now doing textiles uh, to pick up. And so, you know, put, so what happens is trade is about allocating where productivity is. And it, countries don't have fixed, unless you're a very, very small country, it's very underdeveloped. You know, if you're, you're a cocoa exporter in sub-Saharan Africa, again, that's different. But for most countries, even at middle levels of development, you have many goods and services in which you're involved in trade or not, and reallocations take place in the form of technology and productivity. It's not, it's not about these sort of initial endowments. 
So putting it differently, cross the St. Lawrence Seaway, when we're a little west of there, but anyway, in northern New York, Rochester, New York, was the home of Kodak. Kodak basically is dead now. Kodak died. You can look at it as, oh, wow, Fujifilm and the Japanese filmmakers came in and took away their market. Or you can look at it as, gee, digital technology came along and there was no use for Kodak film anymore. And it was much, the fact that the Japanese took away the market had more to do with the fact that we were getting to the point of digital film, I mean, not film, digital imagery, and less to do with the Japanese versus the US. This was just a technology that was in decline. And so when you interfere with trade, you're basically interfering with technological progress. You're not just interfering with one interest group versus another. Thank you. So I have a David Campthorne lining up. Hi. Um, the story that you tell is one in which uh, the US's gains from globalization is, is essentially decreasing over time, and therefore the global public goods that it and other leading economies will provide will also decline. So I guess as an economist it makes sense to assume that this will be the rational behavior of the US. But the question that I ask is, is there any way that we can gain political support for the provision of public goods, even as the world becomes increasingly multipolar? I hope so. No, I mean, David, it's, it's a perfectly legitimate question, and it, you know, I, I can give you sort of the, the cute intellectual answer and then the more sort of policy answer. The cute intellectual answer is, you know, even, if, even on this trajectory of the old normal that I'm talking about, when I say all else equal, the provision of global public goods is likely to be spotty or less universal, less ample. There's a lot of room for variation in that. And if you can convince the US or if you can get a coalition of wealthy societies to provide them, great. And, and, and so nothing I say is meant to be so deterministic that you, you can't have it's the flip side of what I said about the FSB on which you're working, right? If you have the right ideology in some sense and you, you have certain, be it altruistic or far-sighted belief among a set of leaders or ideally in a polity, you know, you can choose a different path. And it's not necessarily the most economically efficient path and it's not necessarily sustainable for 50 years, but you can choose a very different path. And it wasn't absolutely inevitable that when the US was very large relative to the rest world economy that it had to provide as many global public goods as it did. And I think ideology and foreign policy interests and leadership all played a role in that. So yeah, absolutely. But the challenge is to, to state the obvious and, and the, the elephant in the room, it, it ends up being global warming. You know, if, if we can't do something about global warming, then, you know, the rest of it's all moot. That's putting it gently. And we have not been able to do anything about global warming. And part of that is U.S. ideological stupidities. Um, but not all. And I hope for all our sake, and I think there are some initiatives we all can take or support, that will, I hope, make progress on that. But what I guess what I'm telling you is, if it's been hard up till now, this should, at the margin, make it harder. Not impossible, not definite, but it will, at the margin, make it harder. Um, Adam, before we wrap up, uh, uh, I have just one uh, last question, if you You don't want to go online again? You want uh, to ask a question? <laughs> OK. <laughs> That's your business, not mine. Uh, on China, um, yeah. clearly China and the BRICS have been uh, providing you know, the backbone of uh, uh, global economic growth since the height of the international financial crisis. Uh, of course, now there are you know, concerns about a possible slowdown in China. If we look at the projections of the IMF, the IMF projects a 7.5% growth this year. This is exactly what the Chinese authorities believed to be, you know, a sort of a consistent target, uh, I mean, consistent with their uh, internal, uh, internal uh, objectives. Um, 
I mean, can I ask you what is your take on the uh, perspectives, on the short-term perspectives on China? If if we go, if you go through the WIO, the IMF's WIO, there is very little on China, which may sound a little bit suspicious. Uh, I don't know if you share my concern or you are more optimistic. Okay. Um, I've made a bunch of great sweeping statements tonight. I, I have to qualify by next one. I, I, I am rapidly learning more about China, but I do not profess to be an expert on China. We have probably the U.S.'s greatest expert on Chinese economy, Nicholas Lardy, at our institute. Um, and I learned from him and others at the institute to work on this. But I'll take responsibility for what I say. But just to say, this doesn't fall into the category of the holy writ I was giving you earlier. This is more in the apocrypha category. Um, my view, our view, is we're probably not as sanguine as what you're saying the IMF came out with, but we're still far more sanguine on the Chinese outlook than the market perspective and the current consensus. And if anything, we're more sanguine than most on the medium term. So let me, let me break that down. So in the short term, there's clearly been a slowdown in China. Uh, a large component of this is intentional in the sense that Chinese financial authorities have tightened up on uh, bank credit in various ways, and they have Chinese government authorities have tightened up on corruption and, and spending at the local government level. Um, and this is a drag on the economy in the short term. It also, I think, almost universally would be recognized as a positive for China's growth and sustainable growth going forward, as well as various other benefits. Um, so the real question for the next one to three years is A, to what extent is the slowdown intentional and therefore calibrated and controlled versus getting out of hand? B, to what extent can they offset the slowdown with some other tools at their disposal? C, what do you think is left as the growth rate once you cut off this froth corruption and can they rebalance to something else? My view, based on our view, is A, while they don't have perfect control over it, this is more like the savings and loan crisis in the US of the mid-90s and less like the global financial crisis of 08, meaning it's costly, it's not good, it's gonna be a drag on growth, but it's not systemic, it's not likely to keep multiplying on itself, it can be contained. The government's gonna to have to write a check, there's gonna be a temporary disruption of credit, it's not good, but it's not disastrous. Now that is a highly contentious point of view. There are people out there who make much fancier arguments about China. But that's where we stand, I stand. B, um, do they have other tools at their disposal? They have a lot of other tools at their disposal, including the fact that China has huge fiscal room. It has a lot of resources in the government they could spend or purchase or do tax cuts. Or tax cuts are not really meaningful there. So spend in various ways to offset the slowdown in growth. They're choosing not to do that because a lot of the spending would immediately get siphoned off into corruption and because they want to have money on hand for fixing the banking system if they really do clean it up. So some colleagues of mine like Fred Bergston who spoke here I guess some months ago would argue they're taking a not so nice way out which is they're go back to intervening heavily in the, in the yuan dollar exchange rate, driving down the yuan against the dollar and trying to make up for the slowdown in domestic growth by exporting more to the US. I think there's some merit to that characterization. Um, the last few months, the Chinese authorities have been intervening very heavily in exchange markets. Um, I'm not thrilled with that, but I'm not quite as concerned about that as some people because in the end, as I said before, for the US, to some extent, this is not great. They're shifting some of the burden on others, but ultimately stability of China and growth in China is more important to the world economy than, than, than if they have a breakdown. So then the third point was, what do we think is the underlying growth rate going forward if you cut off this corruption and overspending? Um, we think, you know, who the hell knows, and a lot of the numbers are made up, but 
uh, to the extent that the numbers are meaningful, we think a, ch a China that does do these reforms can still sustain a growth rate of 7 to 8 percent growing forward, which would be significantly slower than it was over the past 10 years, but is higher than a lot of other people's estimates. Um, and a lot of reasoning behind that, but the short answer is, the short explanation is, A, we don't think there is such a thing as a middle income trap, um, and B, that we think there is precedent for rebalancing the economy to consumption and away from the overinvestment. It's doable. Going back to the spirit of my response to David, just because it's doable doesn't mean it's going to happen. It depends on the choices. It depends on the politics. But it's doable. Thank you. So on this uh, positive note, we do have some further questions, but uh, I think we're going to uh, wrap up. Um, Really, thank you for spending with us, uh, you know, uh, half a day. Um, pleasure. Really, we appreciate it very much. Uh, and really, thank you for uh, being with us today, Adam. No, thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. Just have a seat for one second. We'll just uh, uh, wrap up. Um, a few comments uh, before we adjourn. First of all, I want to thank you, Adam, for your lecture this evening and to Domenico for leading our discussion. Uh, thank you, Adam, for being only mildly depressing, as you put it, uh, and for pointing out that this return to the old normal of economic uncertainty and, um, and slower growth also has some good and reassuring qualities, including um, less inequality. And uh, for countries that still believe in the rule of law and human rights and engage in global trade, uh, some continuing growth and prosperity. So there were notes of optimism. Uh, and for all of your comments tonight and for Domenico's role, I thank you both. I just want to let our audience know that the edited video will be posted to uh, the CG website. There'll be a blog there where you can add your comments if you like. Our next event in the CG Auditorium is coming up quickly. On Thursday, May 22nd, we welcome James Wilsden of the University of Sussex. He's going to discuss science policy and the importance of protecting intellectual property for the sake of innovation. And then the following Thursday, May 29th, Joseph Karen. Uh, former ambassador and now in the Asia Pacific Foundation uh, will be here discussing factors that have shaped Asia's past and will continue to influence Asia's future development. Uh, that event is co-sponsored by the Bosley School of International Affairs. So visit CG's website to reserve your seats. Thanks for coming to CG this evening and have a safe journey home. <laughs>